Well, I love I love authors that write on the topic of work because I pastored for just over a decade. And then I stepped back in my 30s. Now for the last four years, worked as a full-time freelance writer. And the transition from um, working in pastoral ministry all of a sudden to switching different occupations and not being full-time involved in the church, it was a bit of a mind warp for me. And so I kind of had to rethink the way that I thought about work. So I'm, I'm glad that we're having this conversation today. Very timely for me, and I think very timely for many in our audience as well. So, Well, that's great. As you know, it's a hugely important subject and one that I have wrestled deeply with, and I'm glad to be able to have a chance to have a conversation with you about it. Before we go there, uh, give our audience a sense for who you are. How did you first come to faith in Christ? Give us a quick nutshell, I guess, of that. Sure. I grew up in Idaho. Um, both my parents were veterinarians. I grew up on a small ranch in Idaho. My dad was of Jewish heritage, though he wasn't practicing. Uh, and I'm not sure he ever really set, touched, or, uh, stepped in the synagogue, but he came from that background, which meant that education, family, and those kinds of things were very important. And my mom was Catholic. And uh, so I grew up in that environment. It was a really loving home. We had six kids in eight and a half years. So we were, we were very close, including one uh, severely handicapped sister. Which, and Peggy really taught us uh, so much about life and the importance of acceptance. And, and, uh, and in many ways, I think she, next to my parents, she taught me more about life than any other person that I'd ever, ever been around. And so, so that was my upbringing. And then I, I went to an undergraduate school. I got a degree in chemistry and biology. I thought I wanted to be a doctor, which was the reason I got a degree in uh, the life sciences. I love the science. I love the idea of helping people. But as I reflected on it more, there were two reasons I decided not to do that. Uh, and this ties directly into the beginning of our work in, our faith and work conversation. Is one reason was I decided I didn't really like the nature of the work, you know, giving shots and cutting on people and being around sick people all day. But more importantly, I became really enamored with this idea of leverage, that a doctor's contribution to society is limited to the eight or 10 hours a day that they work. And if you're working toward the right uh, set of goals, your, your contribution is multiplied the, by the number of people you have working together toward those goals. And that literally was the reason I went into business. I didn't even know there was such a thing as a master's in business administration. And, um, but I was really caught up in that idea. So, so I went and I got a, um, an MBA in Boston. And coming from that, I joined a startup company. And that leads directly into the question about how I came to a surrendered faith. So I I'd always gone to church. My wife and I got married in the church. We were married about six years. And in my late 20s, I was working for a startup company, which I joined. I had five offers coming out of business school. I took the lowest paying offer. So uh, even though I'm a math guy, maybe I had a little trouble with math. <laughs> but it was all about, the end, about creating value, you know, yep. and building something. So uh, the company was growing fast. It was the 110th fastest growing company in the U.S. And I was started as the CFO and I couldn't spell CFO and it was you know, kicked upstairs to be a president. And right at that time, I got invited to a camp, actually a Young Life camp in Colorado. And I climbed up on a rock above that camp and just started weeping. And I thought, what is this about? And I think in hindsight, it was the juxtaposition of the serenity of that environment just stood in such contrast to this turmoil within me. And I said, I'm just not willing to go on living a divided life. And uh, I, I want to fully commit myself to something. So, and I didn't even know if God was part of the answer, even part of the question. So I, I read 16 books in the next eight months. I stopped going to church because I thought it was hypocritical to worship a God I was no longer sure existed. Um, but uh, through that process and walking with two other couples, my wife and I ultimately began to see that God uh, is real. And, and I decided as the lawyers would say, based on the preponderance of the evidence, I think it's more likely than not that God exists. And either he does or he doesn't, irrespective of what I believe, right? And so yeah. I decided I'm going to push all my chips onto that square and say, I, I believe, a God, that you do exist. And I'm going to bet my life on that fact. Barry, what age did that happen at specifically? It started when I was 28, Elliot. And um, okay. my hope and even prayer at the time was, Lord, this was so painful. Uh, I would love to at least have this resolved by the time I'm 30. <laughs> so, so, uh, was that uh, a stretch of life that went on for about eight, eight years? Well, yeah, it, it, it was just after that. So after deciding that um, I would believe that God existed, then the question became, well, what about Jesus? You know, are you going to believe mm -hmm. 
is who he says he is, or a C.S. Right. Lewis says he's either that or a raging lunatic, right? And, mm -hmm. and I, I began to read the scriptures, read the gospels over and over, and as I began to see him, and he says, any of you who does not give up everything he has cannot be my disciple. And I thought, well, if I'm going to be a follower of yours, Jesus, and come follow you, I have to take your word seriously. So, so I basically, uh, wrestling through that, ended up on a run around the lake by ourself, our house when I was 29, Elliot, and said, I give up. And the way I would describe it is with heel marks in the sand, I just came kicking and screaming into the kingdom of heaven. But it still did not answer the question of meaning and work. Uh, and, so, and that was, took the next eight years. So I spent the next eight years really wrestling with that question. And God had to, in his infinite wisdom, provide a context and an understanding of purpose in life in order to provide a context for meaning and work. So I said, okay, I now understand my purpose in life which is to live myself for God instead of myself. But how do I now make the connection between what I'm doing in this moment uh, at work and the, my purpose in life? And, and that would be the next eight years and 350 pages I wrote in my journal, mostly in the middle of the night, just wrestling with those questions. And yeah, that it, is basically what the book is. <laughs> it's it is it, well, it's interesting, the progression there, because I'm thinking of people that are listening mm -hmm. to this and they've wrestled through that progression. So number one, does God exist? Okay, well, if God exists, how do I know that Jesus is the right way to go, right? And then if Jesus is the one, how does this actually impact my career and the way that I spend 40 to 60, 80 hours, well, whatever it is, uh, a week of my life and we're glossing over that pretty quickly but ha how much of a wrestling match was that for you to iron out the details of those three elements you know it was a huge wrestling match and um and i i the way i describe it is uh, for many years i wrestled with god you know it was me wrestling with god and then after a time i was wrestling with god i mean he was on the same side of the table we were wrestling with the questions and was there a moment that switched for you it switched uh, shortly after I committed my life to Christ and uh, really through that act of surrender. And I think we, we worship a gracious God who will mm -hmm. not impose himself on us. But as we surrender our lives in, it's an invitation to let him do his work in us. Mm -hmm. So it was then that began that process. And so the wrestling, the way I would describe it, was a succession of paradigm shifts. I was just looking at work all wrong. As you see in the book, I lay out a number of those paradigms, and I was just so wrong for so long about so many things that one of the fundamental things I had wrong was um, I was trying to live life from the outside in instead of the inside out. I thought if I just get the right job, somehow I'll be filled up. And and the corollary to that, and this was really the central, one of the central ahas for me was as it relates to bringing meaning to our work, was I was trying to derive meaning from my work instead of bringing meaning to the work. Yep. And particularly if you work in something like business, in contrast to, say, being a pastor, as you were for many years, Ezra, um, there's less what you could call sort of intrinsic meaning, at least as it appears on the surface in the work. If you're, if you're a pastor or a doctor or um, a social worker or a missionary or something like that, then it's, oh, I, I, it's very clear about why I'm doing what I'm doing. And it's very consistent with the call of God. But if you're in business or something like that, the, uh, it's less clear. And so what happens is, is you can, I have actually drawn a chart of this, that as you move across a graph of more to less intrinsic value, you can still, I think our work can still be just as holy in any of those professions, but as the intrinsic value goes down, the onus grows on us to bring that meaning to the work. Mm. And it's, not, it's God's perspective of the work that is really the only source of its ultimate meaning. So that was at the heart of my wrestling match. That, that was a hard struggle for me, I would say, switching over, because I had been trained all my life, or not all my life, but, you know, went to uh, my undergraduate and then did master's and PhD. And, you know, so I was trained to be a pastor, right? Lived in that world for how many years, loved that world, might go back to that world eventually, who knows. Um, but then stepping back from that, and now my current role is a full-time freelance writer and working with clients, sometimes I'll get to the end of the day and I'll say to my wife, Janan, man, I feel like sometimes there's a disconnect here between what like I feel like I should be doing and then that work that you know I am doing. And I I know a lot of people are listening to this and they feel that paradox where they're going to a church or they're they're going to a place of business throughout the week and it just kind of feel, they get to the end and they're they're like ah like I don't see how this connects to my relationship with God. What would you say to a person like that who's having those thoughts? 
Yeah, well, I have said that to myself for many years because I had those thoughts and I really wrestled with it. And um, I guess a couple of things. One is uh, when I talked about uh, thinking about things wrong and having to go through paradigm shifts, one of those was just the shattering of this false belief that there is a distinction between the sacred and the secular. I think that's just an artificial dis distinction of mankind. And it, it just, in the eyes of God, I don't think exists. exists that there's a seamlessness to this life uh, and this kingdom of God between the physical and the spiritual. And when you begin to think about it that way, and you begin to think about life from the inside out and out of Colossians, you know, uh, Christ in you, uh, which is the mystery that's been hidden throughout the ages, that it's Christ in us finding expression in all we do. So. So I had the input pipes and the output pipes hooked up backwards. I thought if I just uh, get the right job or if I get if I achieve that achievement will fill me up, and it never will. Uh, what will fill us up is God alone. So out of John, you know, we love because He first loved us, and as we enter into that love and the intimacy of that relationship, it overflows from our heart into the world. And so the achievement is is an output. It's not an input. It's an expression of Christ in us, uh, the hope of glory. And so as I be, as you begin to think about it that way. I think it, it starts to you begin to see how everything we do, whether it's uh, loving my wife and we've been married for 42 years or our two sons or working in business or being on, on boards, they are all expressions of Christ and us. And none is, in my view, holier than the other. And so the test for me to be really concrete about this to your listeners is how do I make a connection between what I'm doing in this moment and my purpose in life? So mm -hmm. take a silly little example like, let's say we have somebody who's working on that formula in an Excel spreadsheet for a strategic plan. Well, how does that connect to my purpose in life? That was how, how visceral I wanted the connection to be and just how practical. Well, now I can make those connections because my working job definition was to contribute to a better society as seen through the eyes of God. And then if I'm working in business, for example, and you can apply this to any role that you're in, whether it's a teacher, or it's a stay-at-home mom, or an architect or a doctor, anything, um, then how does what I'm doing in this moment connect to purpose in life? So take that example of an Excel spreadsheet is, well, what, is the, what are the distinctives of business? Because I was in business and felt called there. What is it that business distinctively can do through the eyes of God to contribute to a better society? So it's things like, we talk about this in the book, you know, responsible value creation, uh, business is the only institution really that creates economic value. You know, all the other institutions distribute it. And you know, not that money is the solution to the world's problems, but, but uh, economic value is the hallmark of a well-functioning society because it's evidence of people being released to contribute up to their potential, right? So business can help with that. Or serving customers. I mean, when we're serving customers, we're serving God, in my view. And creating an environment for employees, whether you're a senior leader where I spent most of my career, whether you're in middle management or you're just getting started, that um, we have a huge impact on the people around us. And, and we can either create an environment that makes people want to go home and, and uh, you know, take a 10 mile run to get the anxious and stuff, yeah. or to be grateful for what they have, or being a good corporate citizen. So when I began to see that that was the role of business, that, well, why does the Excel spreadsheet matter? Well, you want to get the formula right so the, the strategic plan can be right so that the business can fulfill its potential. And it's a noble, I think, even God-ordained potential that can be understood to be there for virtually any profession. So that when I began to make those connections or God made them for me, then I could run down the path and say, now every moment that I'm living is on purpose. And I like how all of your examples in the book goes by that uh that cycle, right, where it starts with surrender and transformation, new creation into the world, that that cycle, I'm thinking about what you're saying. And, and I'm thinking, you know, a lot of this starts with how we began about surrender, where there's a there's a, either a moment or a, a time where we feel impressed by God to then accept a, a calling or a job, a situation. And, you know, if if we're trusting in God, we're believing that our surrender will grant clarity of, of motive or whatever we step into. And, but one thing you, one thing I appreciated you mentioning was <clears throat> you quoted, um, I have no idea whether it will be helpful to others or fulfilling to me. Uh, you were referring to, um, how things are going to turn out. And, uh, you said, I simply, uh, I have to simply put one foot in front of the other. And I I'm interested because a lot of times we'll surrender something or I have surrendered something as, you know, as a young adult 
and it's like, okay, what do I do now? Right. I've, I've just prayed a prayer of surrender to God. And then now there's time and there's this boredom or whatnot. And so I'm interested what your advice then would be to the process or the day-to-day ins and outs of, I don't know if this is going to be fulfilling. It may not feel fulfilling in this moment, but how can I have that mindset better that it's one step at a time and I can be surrendered through this? Yeah, uh, that's a big question, Elliot, and a really important one. Uh, Let me give you two examples. Um, One comes out of the biggest failure of my life, and the second was when I was unemployed. So I think it's important for us to be able to talk about the real things of life. And this is when everyone turns up the dial, and they're (laughs) like, "Okay, this is." (laughs) You you know, you see somebody with a fancy resume and a career, and so on. But well, let's just talk about the real stuff of life, and uh, because let's get under the covers and. Uh, so the, the biggest failure I had was uh, I was involved with a, a very large scale startup in Brazil, and we won the license to compete with the phone company by committing to build out service in 80 cities in two years. So it was this massive startup. We raised two and a half billion dollars, hired 4,000 people in two years. It took off like a rocket. The stock price tripled in the first year. We filed to go public. It was all amazing. And then, and then the capital markets crashed and, um, and we saw some cracks start to show up in the operations and I was recruited to, to go be the CEO in Brazil. And when I got there, it was much worse than I thought. And uh, we ultimately sold the company, but it was for pennies on the dollar and, and the investors, including us, uh, lost money. And, and, and we felt like we should invest one because we believed in it. But two is if we, if we were gonna raise that much money, I felt ethically bound to that, well, we we're gonna be in this with you uh, as our investors. But um, that business failure paled in comparison to uh, the personal and the spiritual anguish that came out of that. And now this is the direct answer to your question is out of that, Jesus words again, came to haunt me, frankly, you know, any of you who does not give up everything he has can't be my disciple. And, mm-hmm. and as my wife were here, she'd say, Lord, we've given up everything. We're, di- we're digging dirt here. I moved to Brazil. Our, uh, my wife and our sons were in Colorado still. And, and, um, uh, so I made 16 trips back and forth to Brazil. And uh, and anyway, and we ended up having to lay off 1,500 out of 4,000 employees to save the 2,500 jobs. And it was just the most painful experience of my life and the biggest failure of my life. And I'd never experienced anything like that or even close to it. And But what did God do in the midst of that? He just had, you know, the, the, in Jeremiah, it talks about, um, I will shape at, at the potter's house. It says, I will... Uh, make the pot into a shape that seems best to me, right? And that the clay is marred in his hands. And those strong thumbs of the pot are just pressed and pressed and pressed on me. And was, what's the next part of everything, Lord, that you're asking me to give up here? And here's the odd thing that came out of that. It was to give up. Are you willing to give up, Barry, any claim on your own future? Are you willing to live fully in the present moment and let me unfold the pattern of your life as I see fit? And I said, even in the midst of that pain, no, no, no. It was the next level of surrender of that control, really, that God was asking me to do. And and finally, I said, yes. And yes, Lord, I will. It was a level of trust that I'd never been able to go to before. Because surrender is not one and done. And what came out of that for me was the recognition that surrender is not once in a lifetime. It's not even once a day. It's moment to moment. And our kids had a little... Um, uh, Nursery, they were, they were in a play and they sang a song in that play about that age. And, and uh, the, the song in that play was called My Way or Yahweh. And I think it's just a beautiful depiction of the moment. And, and I would encourage our listeners here to think about five occasions throughout the day, just regular occasions. You're sitting in a meeting, you're talking to somebody, say you're sitting in a meeting and there's my way or Yahweh in every single moment of our lives. Am I going to say something in this meeting because I want to look smart? in front of my peers, or am I going to say something in this meeting to advance the cause of the meeting, and by doing that, advance the cause of the organization, or whatever the purpose was. And it's my way out, and it's, is it out of self, or is that out of selflessness? So so for me, that notion of meaning, and that's where it's fulfilling, is am I living every moment for God or for myself? And as I do that more and more, he does unfold the pattern of our lives in ways mm-hmm. that we never have predicted and or imagined and it's easier for me to say that now and I'm, I'm 66 just to you know take the mystery out of it um and but it's i've seen that now how god has answered that over and over and and it really the, the meaning is found in the moment and you know mm-hmm. god is the great i am and the only place we meet him, i meet him is as i am 
you know, buck naked right here where I am, just in the things I'm wrestling with. And he will use our circumstances to shape us. And it's really the genius of his design is that he, he accomplishes his work uh, in our souls and in the world simultaneously. And he does it through the most ordinary experiences of our lives. You shared about the time, I think you were 35, and you're sharing with a group of investors, I think out in California, and you, you're you worried about the presentation, and you're staring out the window, and then you say, oh, and you go through this mental checklist, why am I nervous, right? And I, I remember at the end of that, I think, if I remember correctly, uh, you say, well, the underlying reason why I'm nervous is pride, right? There's that feeling of that. And, and I'm wondering for people that are listening and they they don't see that connection again between what they do with their work and that connection with how God is shaping them. How would you say work molds us more into the image of Christ? Yeah, I for me, my career has been the crucible for the transformation of my soul. I have grown more through my work life than through any other aspect of my life. And God uses our work to do his work in us. I'm I'm convinced of it. I'm living proof of that. And and uh, as an example, um in that prayer that you're talking about, as it was in California, and I was going to speak in front of a group of investors, and I was young, I was, you know, the chief financial officer of a public company, and I'd never done it before. And and what I realized then, and, and many, many times since then, is the power of what I've come to call the prayer of immersion. Just immerse myself in the circumstances, in God, in scripture, and in the feelings, and let, let God speaks to us through our feelings, and that there to do an archaeological dig on those feelings because there's an infra, there's a spiritual infrastructure underneath there. So in that case, it's fear. Why do I feel fear? Well, and if you go through that kind of the five whys that we sometimes do in business, so why do I feel fear? Well, it's because um, uh, I might say the wrong thing. Well, why do you care about that? Well, they've hired, they're paying me all this money to to represent the company, and I want to do a good job. And why? So isn't that okay? I said, well. Why are you really concerned about that? Well, I might, what if I look like an idiot? And it's like, the Lord just gently saying, well, now we're finally starting to get somewhere. Well, why are you worried about feeling like an idiot? It's because I'm prideful. And so he makes a connection for me between fear and pride in that kind of a circumstance. And then as the darkness comes into the light, it cannot stand the light. And so as those issues come into the light, they, they are dissipated and they're power over us is goes away and that literally is the process in my experience of transformation it's that in three of so has this great saying that the path to holiness is fidelity in the small things so just staying in fully in this present moment and letting god work his yeast through the dough in that very experience and and even if things get dark like in the, the brazil experience i talk about you know, our temptation is to kind of skirt around the darkness right and uh, to make the black a little bit gray. And what I've really found is, is the, the way to the light is to make the black blacker than black, is to allow, to, to go right through the heart of darkness, to go right into that place. And, and that is where we will, where God can do some of his most important work. And he then becomes the light of our world he, uh, that we see in very, very tangible ways and brings us into this place of freedom and joy and gratitude that, for somebody like me, just don't come naturally, but are now finally beginning to find their way into the very heart of my being. As I'm listening to you, how do you differentiate between being lazy and pushing forward? I, I say that with this thought in, in mind. I would say for a certain segment of Christians, they've grown up with kind of an understanding, okay, I pursue God, uh, now I go out and I do my work, but I basically want to do everything I can to spend as much time in the church as possible, and we basically look at our work as that divide, right? Sacred and, and secular. And it's almost a second-class thing, right? And so as a result, they settle in their careers, don't maybe achieve a whole lot, and then you have others that are very ambitious and then kind of leave God in, in the background. How do you, uh, as someone who's very successful and accomplished, how do you um, mirror, uh, you know, put those two aspects together of, of being a high performer, but then also running at the pace of the Holy Spirit and not walking too fast or too slow? Yeah. So, well, first uh, response I would give to that, Ezra, it, the right answer to that totally depends on your starting point. Uh, we used to live in Seattle, and uh, I use the example that if you've ever lived in Seattle, you'd see Mount Rainier that towers, you know, 14,000 feet above sea level from sea level. And so it's just there, there two weeks ago. Beautiful area. Uh, yeah, 
So you yeah. see it from everywhere. You see it from the east. You see it from the west. Yep. Well, if you, if you are starting from the, and my, our son just did Ramrod, it's called, right around Mount Rainier in one day, which is 160 miles on a bicycle, 10,000 vertical feet. I don't know how mm. many did. Anyway, <laughs> so uh, if you're starting from the east side of Mount Rainier, and consider Mount Rainier, call it the truth or um, the right place to be. If you're starting from the east, well, how do you move to the truth? You go west, right? Well, if you're starting from the west of Mount Rainier as your starting point, the way to the, to the top is to go the opposite direction. So to your question about kind of laziness and pushing forward, uh, it, it depends on your starting point. If you have a, a, a predisposition to be lazy, then you're probably going to need to push forward more. If, on the other hand, you're aggressive and have ambition that is, is of our own and not of God, it means to probably have that redeemed. And so, so I just say that because it totally depends, I think, on our starting point. But, but, but how, do you, how do you know with that discomfort aspect? Because I, I would say sometimes I'll talk to Christians, and they would sense, if, if I'm feeling any sense of discomfort, that's an indicator the Holy Spirit's telling me to pull back. Whereas I talk to other Christians, and then they'll say, well, no, that, that discomfort that you're feeling, that's natural, and that's part of the growth process, and so God wants to take you through that. Right. What do you do? No, well, I think, I know there's a little quip that, you know, the purpose of the Holy Spirit is to make the comfortable uncomfortable and to make the uncomfortable comfortable, right? And mm. so, for, so for me, I mean, I don't think Jesus was that comfortable in the Garden of Gethsemane. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. I think that uh, as his, his sweat was drops of blood. And I think the one of the things about this, the life with Jesus is he gives power to the pain. Mm. And our, again, our natural inclination is to shy away from pain. And God gives purpose to the pain. He's not a he's not a sadist, and we are not masochists. Believe me, uh, today has enough trouble of its own. Just this life and this world has that. So we can be confronted by every opportunity to grow from that. But what I would say is that to embrace the pain. I mean, to enter into the challenge that is in front of us. And um, kind of part of the answer to Elliot's previous question I didn't get to was in you know, Psalm 90 at the end. Moses concludes. Establish the work of our hands, Lord. Establish the work of our hands. And I read that psalm uh, in the Zirkel Wilderness area when I was unemployed. Uh, and I said, Lord, I don't know what to do. I don't have a job, right? Well, he, he reoriented the perspective of what is the work of our hands? It's to do what's in front of us. So uh, as we immerse ourselves in God and say, Lord, what is in front of us? And the answer might be push forward more. Or the, the answer might be uh, um, uh, Abide in me. Uh, those who wait upon the Lord, you know, uh, will be fulfilled. And so, so there's not a pat answer. You come in, again. It really depends on exactly where we are in the spiritual life. But, but it's like Jeopardy, you know, for me, you know, where you, they give the answer and then you ask the questions. It's uh, that God is the answer. What was the question? <laughs> you know. So it's just God, and it's the person of Jesus mm -hmm. in one new way. That Lord, what are you asking of me now? So if it's a big challenge, like my experience in Brazil, or I've I've been involved with building or turning around eight businesses, and those are incredibly challenging jobs. And and uh, so I'll give you one other little example. Um, it comes from a leadership experience, but I think it applies to anybody. And so I worked for GoGo. Uh, we put internet on airplanes, and I joined the company. It was a turnaround. And we got the company totally turned around. It had an issue of getting de-icing fluid underneath the um, uh the radomes on top of jets, if you see those on the tarmac, and that's not a good thing, you know. The Elliot's from North Pool, Alaska, so he knows a thing oh, or two about that. That's, that's right. right. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> so we got that all fixed, and I'll Great. Get, we, we announced earnings on uh, Friday the thirteenth, March thirteenth, twenty twenty, and COVID hit on March fifteenth. <laughs> and I thought, Lord, we just got this turned around. I don't know if I have the energy to do this. And and it was during Lent, and I described it as an unrelenting Lent. And, <laughs> and as I stayed in that place and entered into that place, uh, and it was, I just sensed God saying to me, Barry, are you willing to go from reluctant obedience to joyful generosity? You've seen this movie before. You haven't seen quite a horror movie like this one. It's pretty tough. Um, but but you have seen it before. You have some sense of what to do. And and but are you willing to just give generously of yourself completely? So that's an example of, of immersion and immersing in those circumstances and kind of falling. Because uh, I'm I'm convinced that God's will and his word is embedded in every moment. So what is your word, Lord? What is your will that's embedded in this moment? Well, his will for me was, you know, suck it up, you know, stay in there, give it your all. I have no idea where it's going to turn out, just like that quote you, I had no idea. And we really could have bit the dust. And the company um, 
just about went bankrupt and the stock price went down dramatically, lost 90% of its value. So, and fortunately it turned out to be a huge home run on the turnaround, but, but we didn't know that at the time. Yeah. So, so, okay. So it's, what do you want to do right now? Establish the work of our hands. What is right in front of us? What was right in mm. front of us? Do the next thing. You know, it was develop 16 levers for how we could save money. You know, we sell the business that was losing money and then refinance the rest of the business. And so it was a three part plan that we came up with and we executed on it. But that was the call of the moment was to, to give generously of myself uh, and into whatever it took to get that done. So I'm thinking of uh, young adults and kind of the younger generation. And it's easy. I think it's natural for us to then compare our life with someone who has already accomplished even, you know, getting ice. What was it? Getting ice off of uh, what, what was that that you said you, you were a part of? There was de-icing fluid when you spray it in the wintertime on right. your phone, like you do in Alaska. There's a yeah. radar that has the internet um, antennas in there. Well, there were holes in there and the de-icing fluid would go in there and it would gum up the antennas so they wouldn't work. Okay. I see. Incredible. Yeah. So, so we don't have to worry about that in Alaska anymore then. That's great. But, you know, comparing uh, to success stories, I think is what I do, you know, just turn 23. I do that a lot with, with people who have gone through life or it may not even be that much older than me and have, have already succeeded in a lot of things. And, you know, it, it's hard to stay away from comparison, of course. And so I guess my question would be, what is your advice for maybe even the 20 year old version of you maybe doing the same thing of comparing or maybe we're saying too much of uh you know when will i get there instead of how can i get there um what is the what is the steps what's your advice for someone to have that that understanding that it's a maybe it's a how instead of a just a win yeah well i absolutely made the same mistake Elliot. in fact uh through a prayer of immersion as I was kind of feeling anxious about this, I would read the lives of the saints even, and I'd be jealous of them. Or mm -hmm. I would see people in business ahead of me, I would just be jealous of them. And, and I thought, well, what is that about? And I realized, I wrote down, I said, the three keys to unhappiness, uh, they, and, I, and they really are, it's expecting, comparing, and competing. And here's the sequence that I went through, set high expectations, compare yourself to others to see how you're doing, and then compete with them. And, you know, people who are achievement oriented, as I'm, I was wired to be, is we focus much more on what's left to be done than in what we have accomplished, right? And so there's this, there's this kind of innate restlessness and it's never enough kind of thing. And it's the antithesis of gratitude. So my first advice to folks would be just to recognize that's the case, expecting, comparing, and competing. And then, and this is where God does his work of transformation of, letting him get into the very uh, heart of our being. And, and it's very hard to know what's driving us. Why am I driving? Why am I working so hard? What is it? Well, it took me years to uncover one of, and this is a pure confession to me, uh, by me, is uh, to understand what was driving me is that I wanted to be famous for doing good. You know, I didn't want to go be Rob Banks and become famous, but I, I wanted to do something that was good, but I wanted to be famous for it. And it's like, that is just a flat out lie. And it and I once I began to realize that, again, God could kind of dissipate its hold on me. And and we have those things, you know, in our 20s, especially. And you know, for me, uh, I was a very strong willed child, <laughs> quick story. I, mean, I, I even smoked cigarettes for a while, but I but I quit when I was six. Um, that's the way I say, which is true. My mom, <laughs> when I was five years old, she said, Barry, if you ever decide to start smoking. <laughs> Uh, just let me go. Don't go burn the barn down. I mean, that's how strong I was, right? And so I decided when I was six, I wouldn't like to start smoking cigarettes. <laughs> I said, Mom, I'd like to start smoking now. So she had these unfiltered Chesterfields, and I invited my buddy over from the second grade uh, to watch cartoons and smoke cigarettes on Saturday <laughs> afternoon. Well, I, uh, I, uh, I did. I turned green, blew my chips. That was the end of my smoking career. But I said, okay, I have to figure this out. So there was a strong will that's deep within me, but it also coincided and coexisted with this yearning for God, uh, just this yearning. For when I was six, I also had two ambitions in life. One is I wanted to be bald like my dad. I thought it looked cool. Um, but, uh, I'm getting there now. Oh, no. Mission almost achieved, yeah? yeah. <laughs> yeah. The second one was I, I wanted to be a priest because a, a, 
priest was the only person I knew who seemed to know God and to tell people about others. So I had this, just this yearning for God that was a very uncomfortable bedfellow with this strong will. And that's what had to get reconciled and has had to get reconciled in me over the years. And, and the only way to have that reconciled, in my view, is to is surrender, surrender it to the Lord, and that he then reorients our thinking. Mm. So he alone is the Lord of our life over every square inch of every thought you know, that can become captive to him. And, and once we learn to live one life under God, an integrated life, with him as our master uh, and everything else, uh, I don't really like those words, but as a slave, it's something that is submitted to him in joyful, opportunity to live our lives um for him and have him live his life through us that is the, that is the way to break that paradigm and yeah. that paradox and that log jam is it, to have god at the top isn't that just what every person that is struggling with i think especially in their early 30s um like i am it's that wrestling right you're you're saying okay god here's what I think I've, I've been called to do or I'm doing, but you don't understand the motivations necessarily that are driving that. Uh, if someone's there right now, how do you untangle that? How do you reveal what's really driving your motivation to perform and work and do all you do? Well, for me, it, it starts with prayer. And by prayer, I mean listening prayer. So for me, 90% of my prayer is listening. So I've written over 10,000 pages in a journal. It's just my way of praying my way through life. So I listen to God generally in scripture. So to make, I, for example, live, my wife and I both listen to a Praise You Go app every day. And it's mm -hmm. a scripture and it's lectio divina. It draws you into that. And then let the scripture come into us. You know, it doesn't matter how much we go through the Bible. What really matters is how much of the Bible goes through us, right? And so as we too can become the word made flesh. So as we, I would just go to the place of your unrest. That's what I have found. Go to the place of my unrest. Uh, go to the place where I'm feeling comfortable and, and, and bring that to God and say, Lord, just bubble it up. And he will, he will. The, one of the ways the spiritual life works, as in my experience, it's like a lake where you're lowering the water level in the lake. And as you lower the water level, it reveals all kinds of rocks that you didn't see was there before or there before. And that's what God does is he says, as you give me permission, I will lower that water level and graciously, I will love you. And I will pick out these pebbles that are causing you pain. And then as it goes farther, I will pick out these boulders that are causing you pain. And then as we go farther down, we begin to see not only a lake, but there's entire landscape within us. I was just reading Ezekiel this morning and, you know, there's this, there's this dead sea that has no life that, but as God alone is on the throne, as it describes in Ezekiel or the last chapter of Revelation, the living water flows from him and it brings uh, that living water brings life to the salt water. You know, it, he wants to bring life to those parts of us that are hidden that we didn't even know were there that, that are a part of our nature that is not the way God designed us. And so it's, it's this reclamation project and, uh, so a way to pray for me is is just here's one little thought is think about think about the promised land is within us and just read the old testament through that lens and read genesis through that lens that that thorn bushes will be replaced by junipers and streams of living water will come through us and that you know, we do a lot of work with the poor in central america and they have a beautiful saying there is that we make the road by walking on it and i think that it's true of the landscape of our very being that i think it's kind of the shape of our souls is this landscape that uh, reflects all the places we've been, the deserts, the mountains, the streams that flow through us, the hard rocks. Um, so, so, but God will reveal that to us. And, and uh, so that's been my experience. I also read a number of books that were helpful. Uh, there's a book called Circuitous Journeys that uh, really says that each of us has a kind of a directional image that guides us. Uh, and it took me a long time to kind of understand that. Uh, but for me, as I went through that, I described this kind of two parts of myself. And so for me, my directional image is, I concluded as division seeking unity. There's this divided part of me that is seeking unity. And it really is an answer to Jesus' prayer in John 17, that we might become one as he and the Father are one, that we can be one, one with him. So to me, that's in, in many ways kind of the thrust of my entire life. So as you begin to see that, you begin to see, okay, now I understand, Lord, what is driving you are showing that to me. And, uh, there are parts that are divine, and there are parts that are not divine. <laughs> I, I love that imagery. That's going to stick with me. The, the lowering of the lake there. I mean, that, that's, we've heard about, you know, being in the West, Lake Mead and all that, right? And, and the lowering of the lake and what that reveals. I think that's that's spot on. One of the things, we've brought on a couple authors lately, and they've talked about the importance of prayer walking, right? 
and what that does. And that's one of the things I love to do where I'll, I'll go and walk in our community and then uh, have baked into that a time of release where I say, okay, God, I'm feeling anxious because of, and then name it, right? right. And, and that imagery you painted is just spot on. It lowers the lake and you begin to see, okay, so this is the real reason I'm worked up today. And um, I love that. I love yeah, that. Yeah, and I'll, I'll give you two other little examples. Ezra. So uh, so I, I love being in nature and we live in Colorado. And one of the things I've realized about nature is that the harmony of nature reveals the disharmony in me. And then when I go into nature, it's all in balance. You know, trees die and they rot and they pr produce uh, fertilization for the next level of trees that stream. The water is completely obedient to God, right? It, it flows, it follows the natural laws of gravity. So all of nature is in harmony. And when I enter into that harmony, it just, it's a med, it's a mirror that just reveals the disharmony in me. And it, it'll just, it'll, it'll reveal the anxious to me, anxious mm. to me. The, the second thing is, as I was hiking in the um, in the Pacific Northwest, where it rains a lot, and I was watching the trail, and this is another picture of the spiritual life for me. There's this little rivulet of water going down the trail. You know what I'm talking about, right? As you, you just see this water starting to form, and it formed. It was about an inch wide. And it would form. And it would hit a little dam of sticks, and that would build up a little mini reservoir behind that. And then, at some point, the the pressure of the, of the water behind that dam would break the little dam and it would be a breakthrough. That is very much a description of the spiritual life for me. As mm. we go, we're kind of flowing, we get into a jam, you know, what's driving me? I'm confused. In my case, it was a massive log jam about what's the source of meaning and work. But at some point that God breaks through that. And then we can, it brings us into this place of ever deeper freedom. And that is really the ultimate, one of the key elements of the destinies of the, the spiritual life for me. It's freedom. It's this, it's this freedom to be just live into this design that we are made for. We're going to link to your book, The Spiritual Art of Busyness, in the show notes below. People can pick that up, check it out. Uh, I'd, so it's, it's like a 40-day. So you as you start off, you kind of outline it, and then it's 40 days of basically walking through, you know, um, how you can um, live a as one author said, an unhurried life and, and really understand how God is working in the midst of, of your work. And so I'd highly recommend that uh, to those in our audience who are wanting to put your belief into action. So Barry, thanks so much for joining us today. It's been an honor to have you on. It's my pleasure. I enjoyed our conversation.